Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of PBS Wisconsin's online gardening series, Let's Grow Stuff. Welcome to this year's virtual Wisconsin Garden and Landscape Expo. I hope you'll enjoy this special educational presentation, and remember, you can leave your questions for our presenter at any time by typing them into the chat, and we'll ask them in a live Q&A at the end of the session. Also, don't forget to stick around and check out everything this virtual event has to offer. From inspiring garden tours to an interactive exhibitor mall, there's something for everyone. And thanks for joining us. Now, please enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to Fearless Propagation. I'm Nyka Vaughn, owner of Plant Salon. Plant Salon is a plant boutique in Chicago, Illinois, and we specialize in beautifying people and plants. We offer indoor plants, plant supplies, and botanically oriented self-care and home decor. Today, we're gonna to talk about fearless plant propagation. Taking some of your favorite plants from your plant collection and making new ones. Um, what I love about propagating plants is that Plants aren't waiting for us. They are constantly trying to propagate all the time. Um, if you've ever owned a succulent like a jade plant or a burrow's tail and you cleaned the shelf around it and found one little leaf with little roots growing off of it, pink or white hairs, that's a mini plant. It's a new plant. Um, what's awesome about plants is it's a little bit of a numbers game. The more attempts and tries you do, the more success you have. So it's a great reason to do lots of plant propagations, make them, and to try different techniques. It's empowering to new plant parents, and it is, you know, a badge of honor to plant collectors that you learn more about the plants in your care and the different techniques that resonate with one plant more than another. So today we're gonna to talk about some different techniques. Um, we're gonna talk about the different parts of a plant that you use to propagate and um, how easy it is and that it's a lot of trial and error uh, and plants want to propagate so they're on your side. So where do you start with plant propagation? The easiest place to start is just to think about the plant you want to propagate and what part of it do we actually need in order for it to grow into a new plant. I feel like some of the easiest plants to start off with, um, one of them, the kite, is a trailing plant that has a stem, like a vining plant. Um, so pothos is a great plant. This is a Brazil philodendron. And what's awesome about it is there's a lot of space between the different parts of the plant. So you really can see, oh, this is the leaf, this is, the aerial root, this is the stem. So where do we cut? For a trailing plant like this, we want the node. The node is the part of the plant that has the blueprints for making a new plant. It has the blueprints for growing roots. It has the blueprints for growing branches. Um, there are times when you can actually cut just a leaf and plop it in some dirt or water and grow roots, but it won't grow into a full plant unless it has that growth point. And on these plants, that's called the node. So what we wanna look for for a node, um, one of my simplest tricks is just to, I call it like looking for the why, right? You're gonna look for where there's a little natural branch. So this is a nice long stem. Here is a branch that's making a new, it's making a leaf. So it's a nice Y shape. Where that Y comes together is a bump, there's a line, there's some aerial roots, that is our growth point. That's what we want. So if we were gonna cut this, we would want to take our clean scissors and we would cut about an inch or two below that node. And these aerial roots, right now they're pulling in um, elements and nutrients from the air, they're pulling in humidity from the air to help support the plant. But if we put this in water, these will slowly turn into what they call water roots. 
but they're just basically roots. And so what we're wanting to do is by putting it in water, we're going to grow a, a body of roots that's going to help support the rest of this plant to keep it growing into a whole new plant. Now, I am going to next snip off this leaf. And the reason why I snip off this leaf is I want just the node by itself. You can see that guy there. Just the node by himself. And the reason I want it just by itself, and I don't want to stick, have all of this down when I go to put this in water, is that the water might rot this leaf. And then that's gonna introduce a lot of gross bacteria and stuff into our water. So by removing that leaf, it also is one less body part <laughs> the plant has to try to make food to support. So we want these leaves to work. Generally, you're gonna use about two to three leaves per cutting to help generate some food for your cutting. And then you want the node. And now we're just, we need a vessel and some water. Now, this is one of the things I love the most about propagating and experimenting is the stuff, the equipment we get to collect <laughs> as part of propagating. Um, and one of that is the vessels. And it, you can just have so much fun with this. Um, I am such a collector that I collect like everything and I will totally stop and collect little odd bottles. Um, I prefer glass for my water propagations generally so that I can see the root development as it's happening. I feel like um, a big part of plant collecting is the experimentation and the learning. And so I wanna kind of learn more about my plants and see what they're doing. Um, learn the difference between how a cane begonia versus a rex begonia grows in water. They look totally different. So um, I love to collect glass, but really any kind of vessel will work. Your drinking water glass will work. Like any glass, any kind of container will work. Um, what you do is you're going to find a bottle. So this is nice, a nice household basic bottle, amber bottle. Um, you can get as creative as you like. I think this was a nice little vintage piece. Um, we're going to fill it with water. I would highly recommend if you have access to distilled or rainwater, your plants will be so happy. They will love you. Um, you will just get results faster because there's less stuff that your new plant that's trying to form roots has to overcome, such as like, you know, the minerals, the chlorine, all the extra stuff that can be in tap water. Um, so if you know you have harder water or that you've just got like kind of really a lot's going on in your water, you might want to think about trying distilled water or um, even rainwater and uh, seeing what kind of results you get with the same kind of plant. Um, I use a combination for my more finicky plants. I totally will still use filtered water. Um, most other plants, tap is fine. Uh, what I like most about water propagations is it is an amazing way to decorate your house. On um, You know, like, it looks like you have a million plants right here, but really it's like one, two, three, four, you know, bottles of stuff going. Um, once the roots get really established, they kind of take on this like artwork kind of vibe. They look sculptural. Um, I am notorious for letting my water propagations go in their container for a very, very, very long time. Um, but it doesn't take long. Uh, when, when a plant is well suited for a water propagation, you'll see results in about two weeks, maybe three weeks. If the lighting's a little off or the temperature's a little off, it could take a little longer. If the um, leaf was not in the best condition, like it was already kind of like a not so happy leaf, a dying leaf, then because it's the mother leaf, it doesn't have as much nutrients to grow new roots. It's just gonna take longer. Um, some plants like this cane begonia totally, totally love water propagation. Um, so you can see in there, it's just a nice, it's like lace almost. Um, and what's neat is it will start to grow new little plants off of the roots. Uh, 
this is a peperomia and ooh, as you can see there, I'm a big fan for um, when there's gonna be a mother leaf. So let's talk about this. Some plants, they will propagate from any part. Their growth point is any part of their leaf. Other plants like our pothos and our trailing uh, philodendron Brazil, they need the node. So what's neat is you can start to figure out, oh, this technique really works well for A, B, C, and D type plants, but maybe not for E and F. So I know that um, I have really good success um, with my watermelon prop, uh, peperomias in water propagations. I, each one will turn into its own new little plant and I'll let it get roots and it will even start to form little tiny leaves at the base of the stem. And you will then plop that out, pull it right on out and stick that in another pot of dirt and voila, a new plant. Plant division is one of the easiest ways to get a new plant. Um, ideally, you wanna look for a very mature specimen, um, something that's filled out its pot, it's almost bursting out of a pot. So it's a matter of, are we gonna repot this into another larger size? Or is it time to divide this into several smaller plants? I prefer to divide some of these really, really big plants um, up because I think at a certain point when a plant gets so big, it becomes more furniture than specimen and you're treating it as a mass versus you know, a sculptural or a more intricate object. So I think it's neat to divide up a larger plant in order to kind of see more of the the things that you like most about it. For me, snake plants are great vertical, clean lines. When there's a lot of them, you start to lose that. So by breaking them up into smaller batches, uh, you get to have more places in your home to have them placed to draw the eye versus just on the floor or just beside anchoring another piece of furniture. Something to keep in mind when you're dividing your plant is that it's really gonna teach you how your plant grows. So for more arid, loving, deserty inclined plants, they tend to prefer to like to callus after they have been divided or cut. Whereas aeroids or more tropical plants, they don't need so much time to callus. They prefer to get right back into some moist growing medium. So I have already broken up another, this is a 14 inch um, black coral Sansevieria snake plant. And this was part of a 14 inch uh, Sansevieria Laurenti that I divided up. And I want to show you how the roots grow, because I think that's one of the best parts of dividing a plant is you're like, oh, this one grows this way. Okay, so when I buy a pot, I should buy a pot with this in mind. And it teaches you just more of the characteristics of your plant. So for a snake plant, the roots, this is like the mother plant this is the new plant coming off of it. They grow almost with a, it's like a branch or a, like a candelabra kind of arm. What we would do is I, I wanted to make this to even two separate plants. I would cut this again and then let this callus. But as it was, this was all pretty much big connected pieces. Woo, let's find a really good one. still connected. So this will make a great, like a, um, oh, let's see, this will make a good eight inch pot. Whereas this first plant, this will make a nice kind of airy, roomy, <laughs> room to grow six inch pot. Um, but that's, that means I'm gonna have some longevity with that new plant. I can put it on a shelf and it's not gonna outgrow that pot anytime soon. I would like, we're gonna pot up. Woo. 
This is, this is a 10 inch pot. Part of dividing a plant is you're gonna wanna make sure to keep as much of the body of the plant together as you can. Maybe knock off some of the old dirt. You don't wanna beat the roots up too much. If it's very root bound, you might have to be a little bit more aggressive. That's why, there we go. Otherwise, um, this isn't super root bound. This is a very happy plant. So I'm not gonna rip away too much of this root growth. Let's get our, it's right here. I'm gonna use a cactus mix. Because I got to take this, I've, and I've taken many snake plants, um, divided them, and I've seen how they grow, I'll know, I know that it will want to send its roots down deep. So I'm using a deeper pot the goal will be for it to be in this pot until it has filled up this pot all over again and it's ready to be sized up. When you first divide your plant, it is a good idea to be mindful of, does this plant need to callus before I plant it? Plants like a snake plant, um, a Sansevieria, that are from a more arid environment, they do not want excess moisture introduced into a wound, like their new cut. So I'm making sure to use really, really dry soil. And I divided this about a day or so ago to make sure there was enough time for those cuts to callus. If it was a plant like a Monstera deliciosa, um, an aeroid plant, that uh, something more um, tropical, really, that is used to more of a damp growing medium and a more humid environment, I don't tend to let it callus so long. It might literally be maybe an hour, if that. Um, the time it takes me to prepare the, the soil and get the pots together, I'm gonna go ahead and divide that plant up and put that in dirt. Now it wants to keep dividing again. So I know I want about this size and that's a nice long root. So that's why I wanna make sure I'm giving this, oh, where are you attached to? I'm gonna give this plant a lot of space in this pot. There we go. And then one more friend, so it's not such an empty pot. We're gonna center them in the pot and then just fill in. Propagating with moss is one of the gentler ways to help produce a new plant. And by that, it's just kind of like saying, here's a very airy, lofty bed of moss for your little stem to lay upon. You're not going to overly water this plant. A lot of the moisture it's gonna get is from the humidity of the damp moss. And so that's going to help just to gently coax roots into forming into a new plant. This is a very gentle process. Um, it's a slow process sometimes. If you have a greenhouse environment, it can be faster. Wow, I found and bought this amazingly rare plant and it's only this big. <laughs> and I'm terrified of putting it in a big pot of soil and having it rot and die. What is a really gentle way to propagate and to nurture this new little baby plant? And one of the easiest and gentlest things is just moss. Sphagum moss, orchid moss, um, grade A is great, but basically it's just sphagum moss and you're going to get this damp. You're gonna squeeze out the excess moisture and this is your growing medium. 
if you want to get a little fancy, you can definitely, um, you know, add, some people add perlite, they start to tinker a little bit, but 90, like 90 to 95% of what you're going to be utilizing is just going to be the moss itself. So I'm going to take some moss now and start to let it soak up. It doesn't take too long. Sometimes there's little hard chunks in there. You pull out any sticks or anything that might be in there. I have a few plants here that I've been growing in moss. Um, and these are definitely in my more rare I've collection. Uh, at Plant Salon, we have a private collection and it is here to inspire and, you know, to show what a mature specimen of different plants looks like. Um, but in the private collection, there are definitely a lot of projects and some of those projects I will um, stick with just moss because we are babying this plant. Um, I want to give it just enough moisture to make it happy, but at the same time, um, this especially works well for tropical plants that like a damp or humid leaf litter kind of growing medium. So the humid airiness of moss really lends itself to this. This is an Anthurium uh, crystallinum, and it's crystallinum. And this is growing in, oh, I believe this is just sphagnum moss. There might be a little bit of Oregon <laughs> green moss in there too, because I like the way it looks. This is older. This pot totally needs to be changed. As you can tell, I'm a pretty laid back gardener. Um, I will just use a uh, metal probe to kind of tease out. Let me see if I can find one. There we go. I'm going to been growing this in a net pot. So that's why it has these slots and the roots, of course, of course they found their way, right, to grow through. And I'm just going to coax that root back in, kind of like a noodle going through a little slot. This has been growing in a small um, greenhouse just a tabletop greenhouse. And um, I've had it sitting on a, a pebble tray where it's not quite submerged. It's sitting right at the surface of the pebbles, but the um, pebbles have obviously been moist enough and those roots have found that moisture. They are into it. So there's a brand new baby leaf coming in now. Um, I'm probably going to wait for that leaf to unfurl before I repot this one, but she's pretty ready. Um, she's very happy, right? So this was a more of a rare, harder plant to get a hold of. You don't find these kinds of plants at your um, local big box stores. And so the conifer considered more of a collector's plant. And because of the investment, you might be like, I can't have this plant die. So that's why something like a moss medium to grow in is very gentle. It's saying there's not too much moisture. There's not, um, they're not smothering roots. You're trying to avoid what we call root rot. This, this is root rot. This is a pink princess philodendron stem. This is, this is a sad, sad little chunk. <laughs> She's a sad chunk. Um, I have the mother plant is about maybe 18 inches, 24 inches tall. She's got two lovely stems in there. She's had many children over the last few years. This one though, took a turn. She had some leaves. She took a turn. She was in a um, greenhouse cabinet and just wasn't, everybody else was perky. She wasn't super perky. So I moved her to the smaller tabletop um, greenhouse. It's kind of like a large terrarium also, and she's kind of just stayed at the same level. So what I'm going to do is I've already cleaned off my shears and this, see how that's fun. This is horrible. We don't want this. You do not want spongy. Oh, that's so sad, but look what she's making. 
So this is the node, that line right here. Whoop. And that is a bud. So she wants to grow a stem from here. And we want to help her do that. <laughs> we want to help her do that. So I am going to start to cut off anything soft. And I want to cut off anything mushy, squishy, um, obviously discolored. Oh, she's got a lot. We're gonna be right there, right under that node. And the reason we wanna cut off all of that decay, if it's possible, I don't know. There we go, that looks good. Mostly, right? Ooh, we'll see. That's cutting it close. That's cutting it very close. And the reason we don't want to cut too much is if we cut the node, we cut out the blueprints to tell the plant how to grow and she'll just get sadder, shriveled, <laughs> more raisin-like, and, and we don't want that. So she's got a couple of good nodes to work with, but this is the bud that activated, that's trying to grow um, a new branch. So that's what we wanna encourage. So for this, because she had root rot, which means um, basically it was a bacterial infection. I'm gonna use a Fizan uh, 20, just to sterilize or to clean her. You notice we didn't do this with the snake plant. Um, I don't always do that. Uh, if it is a, um, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> I breathe it in. If it is a uh, species that I know is prone to any kind of fungal infections, or if we're battling something, obviously, then what I want is, okay, we're gonna just kind of go in with the most clean slate we can. Um, if I am on a tear dividing, you know, 12 different Sansevieria pots into 24, 36 different Sansevieria pots, and they all look great, and they're pretty run-of-the-mill Sansevieria Laurenti, which you kind of find everywhere, then no, I just will go ahead and divide those up. Um, but for this one, we want to make sure and see how there's a little bit of that discoloration there. So I want to give that a chance to, to air dry just a little. Um, most, I won't say most, many people do like to let their stem cuttings callus before going into a moss mixture. And the difference between that and what we do for plant division with tropical plants is tropical plant roots are very hardy. So when you're dividing a plant, you're generally not breaking, um, you're not causing a lot of wounds. You're not breaking um, large pieces of the plant apart where there's an open gaping wound. Here, we've literally cut a good chunk of the stem off, even though it was rotting and gross. And so that's a wound. So we're gonna give this a chance to heal. Example of somebody who's a little further along that had a similar experience. Uh, this was, this is a Monstera silt, silt pecana. I have a few of them. This one just wasn't, she just wasn't happy. She wasn't happy. Um, and that's always the sign, right? That something's off. And what was odd was I have a few pots of this all in the same cabinet. So why is this one off? So I thought, okay, I'll try water propagating first. That was a no-go. Uh, the leaf started to blanch, started to get more yellow without any new growth happening no new roots were forming. 
So I thought, ah, this is not working. I need an even gentler, even gentler path or method to go. And so I want to show you, there it is. It was, I think, just a little bit of a root ball and um, a little bit of a root ball and this little bit of a stem. The leaf, I don't think it lasted even a day or so once I moved it into the little greenhouse, um, the terrarium. And then you're like, okay, it's got high humidity, high heat. We're just gonna let it do its thing. And either it will shrivel up <laughs> and disappear or this very gentle method will kind of help give it time to grow new roots. And that's what's happening. So we're getting some new growth and we will take it. Oh yeah, there's a new little leaf right there. So I'm going to, this moss looks pretty good. It's still pretty moist. I'm going to go ahead and gently, I'm actually going to take smaller bits and gently make a little like donut around that cutting. There's a bed of moss underneath it. I nestle it in and then I'm going to gently pat moss around it. I'm so glad I got to share some of my favorite techniques with you. And I hope you feel inspired to try a few to make some new plants. To learn more about Plant Salon and our various projects, please follow us on social media and at plantsalon.com. Hi, I'm Ben Fuda, host of PBS Wisconsin's online gardening series, Let's Grow Stuff. Well, we just finished learning about fearless plant propagation, and Nika is joining us now live to answer the many awesome questions that all of you were sending in during her presentation. Um, and don't forget, as we're chatting, you can still keep asking those questions through YouTube, Facebook Live, or the live stream chat, wherever you may be watching. Nika, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Well, as I said, we have a lot of really awesome questions to get to, so we're just gonna jump in. Um, first, a few on the water propagation. Uh, people seem really curious about this. Uh, so uh, Donna and Mike were both asking or wondering, is melted snow just the same or as good as rainwater? Absolutely. I mean, it's like, it probably is the one perk from this winter we've had. <laughs> it's the abundance of snow we've had. Um, and I'm in a lot of uh, Facebook groups for plants and people collecting snow in every pot and thing they can keep it in. Um, if you've got empty containers, what you want is just to make sure that it's fresh snow and not snow that has salt in it, that's been plowed um, or any other sediments and things. But if it's fresh snow, it's great. Perfect. Uh, another question for root, or again, a water propagation. Um, should people think about adding any nutrients to the water when they're doing it or just the straight clean water? I think if you're new to water propagation, just straight water because it's kind of like um, fixing a recipe, right? That if you make this recipe and there's lots of elements and you don't like it, something's off, you, it's, uh, you're gonna have a harder time finding what's the problem is, what's that one factor that I wanna fix. When you keep the um, factors simpler, plant, water, vessel, uh, you, you have an easier time um, making the adjustments you need to get success. And then you can start building from there. So and Kate, adding more things. Perfect. So Kate is wondering, does do you have you noticed that the, if the color of glass that you're you're propagating in makes any difference? She read somewhere that maybe green glass might make a difference. Do you have you seen that in anything? I have heard that also. Um, I've always heard that amber bottles work really really well. Roots like uh, a darker environment. Um, to they don't actually need to be like in the brightest of bright lights. They actually like a little bit of a darker environment to grow. So amber bottles work well. Um, I have had odd odd success with older, like a uh, crystal that's really old, um, but the canted bottles and things, I'll have a harder time sometimes with some of those bottles to work with, but um, clear glass is totally fine also. And then any tips for reusing these glass vessels? So how should people sanitize them, keep them clean? What does that look like? 
If you want to go the super easy route, you're gonna go and buy a bottle brush. You're gonna probably buy multiple bottle brushes. Um, a bottle brush is usually like a longer elongated brush with bristles around it, it looks like a cylinder shape. Um, think of a kind of a, a brush you might use to clean a milk or like a carafe thing or um, a, a baby's bottle, that kind of thing. Uh, the other one, when you get otter small shaped bottles and you're like, nothing fits inside this bottle to clean it, uh, people will use um, combinations of like white vinegar um, with a few rice, uh, grains of rice in there. And the vinegar will help to break down um, the, you know, the different things clinging to the side. It's called what makes the patina on the inside of the glass. It helps to break that down. And then the uh, rice acts as an agitator. And it's kind of like when you exfoliate your face to get dead skin off, it helps to exfoliate the inside of the bottle. So you swish it around and that way um, you kind of even can give it a good hard shake and it'll help to get all that stuff off the inside of the bottle. Rice and vinegar, who knew? <laughs> I love it. Uh, so now we have a few questions on plant selection and, and plant ID. Uh, Amanda is asking, how can she find a trustworthy source for purchasing sort of these collector plants, as you were mentioning? Uh, she's been interested in a couple of varieties for a while, but is a little worried about purchasing from an online reseller. So there's probably like two um, good trains of thought for how to approach it. The first is reviews. If um, there are any reviews for the seller you're considering, that's a great start if they've got like, you know, you know, a thousand reviews or hundreds of reviews, you can pretty much trust that that might be a good place to start buying things. Um, when you do buy from them, what is the experience like if you have a problem, you know, what, you know, how, when you've ordered something smaller and safer, that's less of an investment, how well did that transaction go? That might be a good sign before investing in a plant that is in the hundreds of dollars range. Um, I will say at a certain point, there is a leap of faith that has to happen. And um, cause you will find a wish list plant that you're like, oh, I have to have this plant. And um, it'll break all the other rules of, I don't know this person. Like they have no reviews, it's a private seller. And you kind of then, um, it's almost like buying things from your local community pages. You just have to have a sense of, oh, I see red flags in this transaction, in this communication, or, you know, I have a couple of the people in the in the city and the neighborhood have had good interactions with them, and it, I'm going to take the leap. Awesome. Uh, just, Janelle is asking, uh, is there a good place to go to find out how to identify what plants I already have, or if, if I'm not sure what I have? Uh, are there tools I can use or places I can go? It is probably like I want to say a global uh, approach. So what that means is first plant apps. Lots of people love them, especially I think if you're just kind of like, you know, you're in a plant shop and you don't know the name of it, you're, you, they know a name and you're not sure if it's the right one. You can take a picture of your plant and a lot of these plant apps um, will try to like narrow it down for you. One we love that we use at the shop often is just Google Lens um, and it's free. Uh, basically, you just take a picture you upload it to Google Lens. There's a little like lens icon off to the side. You tap that and there's these sparkles that happen on the screen. And it gives you then, it basically is like searching the internet to find objects that have the same characteristics as what's in your photo. Um, I would say that's probably a good way to go. And then just kind of learning the different characteristics of different plants, how a pilea differs from a peperomia. And once you've learned it, then you know it. Perfect. Well, we have, of course, also a lot of questions coming in on plant care. So for folks who already have a great collection of their own and Christmas cactus seem to be a, a popular theme. So wondering any tips you have for caring for especially large and mature plants. Large and mature plants. Um, one of the, my mom was a gardener, my grandma was a gardener. I think one of the best things I, I learned over the years was that uh, if you have one solid specimen that is decades old. They're just getting older. You know, um, there might be a natural lifespan to that plant, you know, to have a jade plant that's in a 20 inch pot that's three feet tall is an amazing specimen. And at some point, either by accident or natural causes or just time, it might be the end of that plant's um, uh just lifetime. And so that's why plant division really comes in handy. Um, plants like a Christmas cactus, um, they're epithetic, so they can um, 
just by a leaf cutting. You can just snip them, get them going in moss, get them going in water. They'll just, they like to sprout roots just in the air. So they're such an easy plant to divide and clone that it's almost like making a safety for yourself that you have the next generation as backup in case anything happens to your main specimen. Awesome. Jenny from Facebook is asking help. <laughs> she purchased a, a, a plant from a big box store and it came with fungus gnats. So she said she's avoided watering it for two weeks and she's tried some apple cider vinegar, but the gnats are driving everyone in the house crazy. I can also speak from personal experience. I think we've all had one of these moments. What should she do? What's, what's sort of the next step? Oh my gosh. So plant salon, before it was a plant shop, my before, you know, the, the change was a beauty space. That was my other company. And fungus gnats and hairspray were like, ah, because we always had plants in here. So I quickly discovered over the years that first, you're going to have to water less um, because you are creating an environment that is like a resort for fungus gnats. So you need to kind of make it unwelcoming. And by having a drier growing medium, um, they're less likely to want to lay their eggs in because it's not going to be so welcoming. Uh, you want to break the life cycle. One of my favorites, aside from getting really strict about, you know, watering less, is adding sand to the surface of your pots. Um, I go with... Um, when I was first learning this <laughs> trick, I went with black sand. You can get um, so much like from either craft supply stores or um, a pet supply store, we can get larger quantities. And uh, I liked black because it was more of a decorative thing. It kind of was more consistent with uh, potting soil. And you put about a quarter inch to a half inch at the top of each pot. You wanna cover every little bit so that just the stems are coming out. Um, it's gonna do two things. It is more abrasive for the fungus gnat to have to dig through. It's more harmful for its body. And so it kind of cuts the life cycle. And then also it will help to retain more moisture in your growing medium because you kind of made this nice, you know, denser layer um, on the surface. So by cutting back on your watering, your plants are going to be okay. Yeah, plants are pretty resilient. I think we, we forget that sometimes, but they can, they can stand up to a lot. <laughs> um, totally. Do you have any suggestions for types of, con you know, better types of containers over others, plastic versus ceramic? Are there uh, pros and cons, anything like that? Um, it's def you definitely want to keep in mind the native environment of your plant. So if you have a plant that is a smaller specimen, it is a plant that natively grows on the forest floor. That means it likes, you know, um, fluffier, moist, humid uh, growing medium, a ceramic glazed pot is gonna help keep that growing medium damp longer versus you constantly having to water it versus putting that same plant in terracotta. It wants to kind of, it's so porous, it's gonna help pull the moisture out. So it's one of the reasons why you might see a lot of succulents and cactus plants that are, um, <laughs> that are, in more of those terracotta pots because we're trying to keep them from being overwatered and too wet. So in our final few minutes, uh, let's jump into some more propagation questions. Again, a lot, obviously plenty of those coming in. Uh, rooting hormones, do you recommend them? And if so, when? I love rooting hormones. Um, I think uh, simpler is better. Um, if you are still kind of kind of confused and like not sure where you want to use them, then I would definitely say um, it's not like a requirement to get your propagations going. When you use them, you're going to generally, it's going to be after you've made the cut. Um, a lot of the rooting hormone um, things you might find in a big box store or order online in your local plant shops, they're more than just rooting hormones. It also will have like a little bit of a fungicide in it. They're all the kinds of, of amendments to help baby a new plant that has just been cut. So by dipping it in the vessel, you wanna make sure you don't make too much contact with your hands. You dip it in the vessel, um, in the container of the growing medium. And I sometimes will even transfer growing medium. They come, you know, in the plastic bottles. It's not very user friendly. I'll transfer them just to small glass jars, like travel size jam jars. And that way it's a really short jar for me to dip the stem into. You wanna just coat the stem, shake a little excess off, dip it into your growing medium and you're set. So Marilyn is wondering about African violets. Any tips for propagating and just general care for African violets? 
Oh, African violets. I'm not super familiar with African violets. We love flame um, violets here. And what we noticed is that as they grow out, you want to be mindful of the growth patterns just at the base. So like where you can start to divide and pull off any new little plantlets. Um, and that's how we tend to propagate them. Uh, Matt is wondering, is there a better time of year to pot or repot uh, house plants versus based on indoor humidity, outdoor humidity, things like that? Spring, summer, fall, winter. Oh, this is a hard one because yes, there is like spring and summer is like when a plant is in its growth season. That's when it's actually <laughs> like it knows that the elements are in its favor to grow bigger. It has more resources. That is not fun for the humans that take care of the plant. So we want to be able to pot our plants all the time. I do. I, I repot plants um, year long. I probably do it more so in spring and summer. And then sometimes I will um, start a project like air layering is another type of propagation um, that uses moss and aerial roots of the plant, I will get air layering projects going in late winter with the goal of severing that, dividing the plants in early spring. Awesome. Let's see here. <clears throat> and can you remind us what type of moss did you use or recommend? Um, or is there a specific type of moss for doing that moss propagation that you'd prefer? The general name is called sphagnum moss. Um, the, uh, what most people tend to look for is, uh, called, uh, it's like, it's one either like orchid moss or it's a grade A premium sphagnum moss. Perfect. And, uh, let's see, Pat is asking, uh, what about, um, cleaning the root rot, uh, going back to that, can you remind her, what did you use to sterilize and clean that? So it can be as simple if you're like, I just, I'm I, you know, if getting in like a humidifier is like a big step and you're like, I can't go with all these other crazy plant things, then just rinsing it with water is such a great place to start. You're just trying to, it's as if you had a really like bad cut yourself, you would want to clean it off. So rinsing off that old decay is a wonderful first start. The next step after that, um, some people will use diluted um, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, some people, I believe, da, 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 that, that that's a good one they'll go with. Um, diluted is key so that you don't burn the plant. Um, I used a product called Fizan 20. It needs to be mixed into a solution. So you definitely want to make sure that you're mixing it correctly so it's not too strong. So again, we have awesome, a lot of awesome questions coming in from folks in just a few minutes left. So where can people go to find out more or to get more of these questions answered, either about propagation, house, houseplant care, any of these types of things? I really think social media has just become an amazing resource for so many of the new plant parents in the last few years. Um, Facebook is one of my favorites because I think it's very conversational. To join your local community plant group, you know, you put your city's name in, put your neighborhood's name in, and put in, you know, house plants and see what comes up. Um, what you find is people who are dealing with the same environmental elements and factors that you are, and you might find people that have different ranges of experience. So when you ask a question, they're able to answer it um, and you can get to know them better. And Nika, um, final question for you. Remind us where we can connect with you. What's the best way to get in touch if folks have questions or where they can visit you? Absolutely. So my name is Nika Vaughn and Plant Salon is at plantsalon.com is our main website. We are also on Instagram and I'm the Instagram <laughs> person. So it's Plant Salon Chicago on Instagram. If you have a question, definitely, you know, send me a note. I'm always on there. Excellent. Well, Nika, again, thank you so much for joining us today, for sharing your love of propagation of plants and your expertise. Um, and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks, guys. Well, stick around, everyone. We have more presentations coming up just after this.